Now that we know what imperialism was, let's look at what caused it. Not just in terms of like what made people want to go colonize and pillage all of these places around the world, but also what ideas did they use to make it seem like it was okay to do that? And how was it possible for them to do it? I mean, huge chunks of the world were dominated or captured in a very short period of time. How did that happen? And why didn't it happen before? As a refresher, when we talk about industrial era imperialism, we're talking about creating an empire by dominating another state politically and or economically. This took the form of formal imperialism, like taking over other places and claiming them as your own, but also informal imperialism, meaning pulling other parts of the world into your sphere of influence and getting them to do what you want through economic domination, usually with a military threat in the background, but without actually having to take over a place. To refresh ourselves about what we're talking about exactly here, let's look at what happened in Africa. In Africa, European nations not only took over almost the entire continent, but they organized it. They had a meeting called the Berlin Conference, and there they decided who ruled over which parts of the African continent, and basically divided up Africa amongst themselves. Obviously, they did not consult anybody from Africa when making these decisions. How did they do it? They were able to colonize an entire continent with astonishing speed. And Africa isn't just a big continent. It's a very difficult terrain. It has the Sahara Desert. The interior has jungles that are really hard to penetrate. The geography doesn't make this an easy conquest by any stretch of the imagination. So how'd they do it? Um, the Industrial Revolution solves that problem. The technological advances that the Industrial Revolution brought to these states made it possible. Um, for one thing, they could mass produce new weapons, especially the machine gun, which was a new invention at the end of the 18th century. It's really hard to fight against a machine gun if you don't have any, even if you do, as it turns out. We'll get to that in World War I. In addition, you had railroads and steamships that made it possible to physically get places that would have been prohibitively far or difficult to navigate before. And you had new medicines that made it possible to go to parts of the world where native disease like malaria would have previously kept people out. In most territories in Africa, um, Asia and the South Pacific, places called tropical dependencies, very few number of Europeans ruled huge numbers of indigenous people. Um, and we're gonna look at how and why that happened. But in Africa, we're looking at formal imperialism, like actually taking over the place and claiming it as your own. In terms of the causes, this is the point of the lesson today. We need to think about causes in three different ways. Often people explain history like it's just a fact, why things happened the way they did. But actually, they're usually a lot more complicated than that. And thinking about them in different categories can really help us understand what happened and why. For the causes of imperialism, we need to look at technological causes, like how it was possible to do this. What technological advances were available that made it possible for one state to dominate another that was really, really far away? Next, we need to look at the prime motivator. Material causes or material advantages, which are specific things, benefits, and advantages that European industrialized states were seeking through expansion, like what was in it for them? What did they gain? This is always the prime motivator for events. We're gonna break this down even further and think about it in two categories. First, economic. So having to do with how money is made and how resources are secured. But then second, political. What advantage did imperial conquest have politically? And that means having to do with the power of a state relative to other states and the power of a government to maintain control within their own state, within their own nation. Finally, we're going to look at ideological justifications for doing it, for conquering so much land. 
And that refers to the ideas that made Europeans feel justified or entitled to conquer and exploit other lands. These are the ideas that make it seem okay. Um, these are the ideas that they tend to advertise. And you can think of them almost always as kind of excuses after the fact. Like we want all this stuff from Africa. And you know, these are the ideas that make it seem like we're nice people for going there and killing a bunch of people and taking it. It's important to think about causes in these three categories because often you'll hear history presented in terms of equal weight. Like Europeans wanted to go spread Christianity and also they wanted natural resources. And those ideas are presented as like equally motivating when in fact history rarely actually plays out that way. If you would like a preview of the actual information we're going to be gathering throughout this lesson, you can pause the slide here, take preliminary notes, and then add details as you go along. Um, details being definitions, stuff like that. If you'd like a challenge, let's go through the lesson, set up your notes so that there are three columns for technological, material, and ideological causes and see how much of this information you can gather on your own, and then check it at the very end when I show this slide again. For a more visually appealing type of preview, I don't know if you guys think in charts or concept maps. I like charts, but lots of people like concept maps. So here's another way of previewing the notes so that you know kind of what to listen for. So if you want to write this down, you can. You don't have to, but then press play again so we can go through the lesson. First and foremost, let's talk about the economic motive for imperialism. This is a material cause. And that material cause, the advantage that Europeans were seeking, the thing that they wanted, was raw materials for industry and markets to sell goods. This means they wanted the basic ingredients that you need to make finished products in factories, natural resources, raw materials like rubber, metals, palm oil, stuff like that. And they wanted a market to sell the goods to. So like after they take all this stuff and go make stuff in factories, they need to sell those things to places where there's no point. So then the colonies also become the place that they sell things to. And in terms of like showing this motivation, Europeans of that time period were almost shockingly upfront about what they wanted and why. Take, for example, this quote by Cecil Rhodes, who was a famous British imperialist um, who led the takeover in Southern Africa or played a leading role in it anyway. And he said, we must find new lands from which we can easily obtain raw materials and at the same time exploit the cheap slave labor that is available from the natives of the colonies. The colonies would also provide a dumping ground for the surplus or extra goods produced in our factories. So pretty straightforward. Here's a visual of how that works, right? Like they take over a place in Africa, extract raw materials, take those back to England in factories, make stuff, and then sell finished goods back to the place where they took the raw materials for, to begin with. As should be clear, Imperialism was really closely linked to making big money. And remember, this is the capitalist era. Um, industrialization required raw materials like rubber or cotton with which to make finished goods in factories, <clears throat> like things made out of rubber or cloth. And while European countries had enough natural resources to begin the Industrial Revolution, as other countries industrialized, they realized that industrialization meant money and that meant power. And so the country with the most money had an advantage. And so the country with the most industrialized economy had an advantage. And so they began to compete with each other to have the strongest industrialized economy. Now, since capitalism is all about seeking profits and the more goods you produce in factories, the more profit you make and the cheaper the raw materials or the basic ingredients are, the more profits you make when goods are sold. And if you have more places to sell goods, which are called markets, you also make more profits. Industrialization and exploiting other places for these cheap ingredients and to become markets was where the big money was at. 
the countries that were victim of imperialism did not have industrialized economies and therefore did not produce factory made goods or mass produced weapons for that matter. So the countries that were victim to imperialism then became markets to sell those finished goods in. Very cute system they set up. And this all sounds very abstract and not super, you know, human, but who do you think did all the work to extract all of these natural resources? I mean, have a look at the map. You could get cocoa, coffee, corn, cotton, dates, fruit, rice, oil palm, peanuts, rubber, sisal, I don't know what that is, tobacco, vineyards, wheat, lots of stuff came from Africa. Um, it was not the white European colonizers who were doing the work to extract all of those things. It was the natives. And here we enter one of the most horrifying chapters of history and one of the parts of history that is really easy for history books to gloss over by just labeling this colonialism or imperialism and then moving on. But think about the people who were affected, who asked for none of this. And remember that this was all about the money each village in the Belgian Congo, for example, was forced to work in harvesting forest rubber, which is hard, unpleasant work. Impossible collection quotas were imposed. That means that Europeans demanded more than could actually be extracted. And failure to extract the amount you were supposed to was punished by death with amputation of the hands being required as proof. And you can see some really just tragic pictures of that on the slide. You can also see chained Congolese slaves on a Belgian rubber plantation and a Belgian colonial administrator comparing himself to a guy from the Congo. Um, kind of smug. Remember when you see images like this, that this was all about the money. And I'm asking you to remember that because ideological justifications, the ideas that Europeans believed or used to justify this behavior, to tell themselves it was okay, and that actually they were good people for doing this, can kind of hide this cruelty and the violence and the motivations behind it. It hides that this was about killing and enslaving the people that they claimed to be interested in saving. Additionally, two recommendations on this point. If you want to know about this period in history and what this colonizing time was really all about. I cannot recommend highly enough the book called King Leopold's Ghost. It's fantastic. Similarly, Anthony Bourdain did an episode on the Congo. I think it's in season one in a series called Parts Unknown, which is fantastic. And it links this colonial past to the Congo and the way it is shaking out in the present. Tragic history. Um, great show. Highly recommend it. All right. So those were the economic motivations. Now let's look at political motives, like what political benefit could Europeans get from this endeavor? Political motives include gaining political power and competing with other countries for strength by adding territory around the world. This could mean getting military bases globally. Remember, this was the age of navies and steamships, and even merchant marine ships needed a place to refuel. So being able to have military bases around the globe was a huge advantage. Similarly, it generated nationalism to unite their populations at home. Nationalism is a strong feeling of pride and superiority for belonging to a specific nation. And it provided an ideology that could unite populations at home that were increasingly involved in politics and generate loyalty to the state. Think of it as the opposite of like what Marx was trying to do with communism. Marx was trying to tell people of the working class that worldwide they were all the same and they had the same interests. Nationalism says, no, your main source of identity should come from the state you belong to and you should be proud of it. So you should see that you have more in common with the richest person in your state than with the poorest person around the world. Having an empire added to that sense that a nation was strong and great and maybe even superior to others. So it was a really politically convenient thing to have. It kept people at home kind of in order. Next, and here is like kind of the imperial trick that you will see over and over and over in history once you start looking. Imperial states were able to make money, a lot of it, 
by exploiting populations abroad to make the economy better at home, which made the standard of living at home higher, and that made unrest at home a less likely possibility. In other words, it meant like kind of almost artificially boosting the economy of a state by taking money and resources from other people that people in the boosted better off state can't see and therefore didn't necessarily feel bad about. Um, we'll see this again when we get to, I don't know, for example, World War II. And finally, um, European rivalry and nationalism fostered a spirit of competition among the European powers. So like people wanted their state to be not just powerful, but the most powerful. How did they do this? Well, in terms of how, industrialization led to imperialism by making it possible to conquer gigantic swaths of land and to dominate parts of the world that were really far away. New technology, like the railroad, like the steamship, like the machine gun, made it possible to get places much faster and with many more people um, and made the violence a lot more effective once they got there. Next, medical advancements allowed Europeans to live in places that they couldn't live before because of disease that was native to the area. For example, malaria had kept Europeans out of the interiors of Africa and India before, but then they figured out how to combat it with quinine, which they then mixed with tonic and then developed a hankering for gin and tonics that you know, I guess remains part of their culture. Militarism was also kind of a, a how they did it and a, um, a material cause too. Militarism means thinking of the military as a totally acceptable way to solve diplomatic problems. Because of the way that capitalism, industrialism, and imperialism worked, you could never have too much land. More colonies meant more factories, and that meant more goods, which meant more money, but also it meant the need for new colonies to sell those goods in. Meanwhile, creating new colonies, or keeping the ones you have from being snatched away, requires military strength. You have to fight for them, or at least threaten to, and then you have to keep the other industrialized states from wanting to take them from you. So states started raising powerful armies and navies and competing with each other to have the largest, strongest army and navy. And so this leads to something new. States started using their military might to conquer land in order to benefit the business interests of private companies in their states because that would fuel the economy, which would ultimately be in the interest of the state. So this militarism made it possible to conquer lots of lands because they had bigger and bigger militaries, but it also made it necessary to keep doing it. It was a, a material cause as well. Let's look at a source and see how much of this we've covered. This comes from Niall Ferguson's book, Civilization, the West and the Rest. And he writes, from the middle of the 19th century until the middle of the 20th, the West, by which he means Europe, ruled over the rest, by which he means the rest of the world. This was the age not just of empires, but of imperialism, a theory of overseas expansion that justified the formal and informal domination of non-Western peoples on both self-interested, so selfish, and altruistic or charitable, selfless grounds. So he's saying that imperialism justified taking over other places um, for like greedy reasons, but also for selfless reasons. And by this, he's talking about like the ideological justifications. He goes on, empire meant living space for surplus population. So it was a place that Europeans could send their people to go and have potentially a better standard of life, which would make their lives better and it would create more space back home. It made secure export markets and higher returns on investments than were available at home. Empire could also have a political function, sublimating or hiding the social conflicts of the industrial age in a gung-ho mood of patriotic pride, so nationalism. 
but it also meant the spread of civilization, a term used with increasing frequency to describe the whole complex of distinctly Western institutions, the market economy, the scientific revolution, the nexus or meeting of private property rights and representative governments. It also meant the spread of Christianity, for in the process of empire building, missionaries were nearly as important as merchants and military men. So let's look at these so-called altruistic motivations for imperialism, the selfless part, the, the thing that Europeans believed or said that made them out to be like the good guys in this story somehow. First, a definition. Um, ideological justification relates to a collection of beliefs held by an individual group or society that provides from their perspective a moral reason for a given action. Ideological justifications for imperialism in this phase in history included social Darwinism and the white man's burden, which are both ideologies of cultural and racial superiority. Um, this is white supremacy disguised as science, basically. Europeans believed themselves to be on a civilizing mission, meaning a moral obligation to bring Western civilization, like its norms, morals, values, and to a certain extent, its technology and infrastructure to less developed nations. Many Westerners believed that it was their duty to teach the quote unquote uncivilized Africans and Chinese how to be Christian and how to live more like Westerners, which they considered to be better. The concept of the white man's burden was new for this age, the spreading Christianity thing we've seen before, but the white man's burden was new. And it claimed that it was Europeans duty, like a moral obligation to civilize and bring technology to these less developed natives. And it was used to justify imperial actions by the Europeans. The white man's burden was the idea that the white man was intellectually and physically blessed with superior virtues that mandated or made it necessary for them to help the quote unquote unwashed masses. So I'm better than you and I have to help you by force. Social Darwinism is the idea that justified the white man's burden. This idea used Charles Darwin's concept of evolution, which is real science, to explain why some cultures seemed more advanced than others in terms of natural selection, which is fake science, right? So like they took an idea that does explain scientific concepts, natural selection in the context of evolution. They took it out of context and used it to explain why some races or societies are stronger than others. And their idea was that the stronger race of Europeans would inevitably conquer the quote unquote weaker race of Africans. So again, to be clear, Charles Darwin's theory of evolution is real science. It does explain how the natural selection or the survival of the fittest allows species gradually over incredibly long periods of time to make adaptations that allow them to survive. Social Darwinism is fake science that uses buzzwords from Jar Darwin's ideas and applies them totally out of context and in a completely unscientific way with horrific human costs. So it takes Darwin's idea and applies it to explain differences in human societies. Europeans and Americans used it to support the belief that their culture and really what they meant was their race was superior. It was the belief that people who cannot survive on their own should make room for more wealthy and best fit people to live. And that society should allow the weak to fail or die, and that this is morally right. Like I said, this is a horrific idea. You can kind of see the connection to like pure free market survival of the fittest capitalism here, though, too. This idea was rationalized by the idea that the colonized nations, poor people or disadvantaged minorities must have deserved their situation because they were less fit than those who were better off. And it was an incredibly tragically influential idea throughout the West. You will probably recognize it most immediately in the ideas of Nazi Germany, although 
it was also an insidious and kind of ever-present current from the late 1800s all the way up through after World War II, not just in Nazi Germany, not just in Europe, but also in the United States. Social Darwinism provided what people back then thought was the scientific basis for the white man's burden. And it was used to justify imperialism. Like, we're helping them. They're not as evolved as we are, and they wouldn't survive without our help. So let's kill and exploit a bunch of them. The White Man's Burden itself refers to a poem by Rudyard Kipling, who wrote The Jungle Book. Sorry to ruin The Jungle Book for you, but it is imperialistic propaganda. Anyway, um, here's just part of it. Let's see if you can recognize the social Darwinist idea in it. He writes, take up the white man's burden, send forth the best of your breed, go bind your sons to exile, like in the empire, to serve your captives need, to wait in heavy harness on fluttered folk and wild, your new caught sullen people, half devil, half child. Horrific. In other words, he's saying, hey, Europeans, we know it won't be pleasant for you to go off and live in the colonies, but you should do your part to help the people that you just colonized, who are wicked and simple, because they have not yet been taught how to live in a civilized way. This is the morally right thing to do. You should be proud of yourself. And these ideas showed up everywhere. Um, there were late 19th century eugenicist ideas, which basically tried to like calculate how evolved different races and people were based on measurements of their skull. Um, <clears throat> it showed up in very free market economies, like super capitalist economies that embraced the idea that like the poor should just be left to kind of, you know, die. <laughs> um, it promoted the idea that some races are biologically superior to others. And as you can see on the right, it showed up in soap ads, which is horrible. You can find some of the most racist stuff in the world, like in this time period in history, and people just didn't think twice about it, which is kind of incredible. Um, here, for example, there is a political cartoon showing Uncle Sam, so representative of the United States, lecturing ju a group of childlike caricatures depicting the people of Hawaii, Cuba, Puerto Rico, and the Philippines. Um, with like more advanced students in the back of the classroom doing their job. I mean, it's just, you know, quite a thing to watch. Anyway, those were the ideal ideological justifications of imperialism. Colonization was weird and horrible and, you know, take from it what you will. Um, please do take notes. If you could pause the slide here and make sure to get all of this information in your notes, that would be lovely. And then finally, if you wanted to see the concept map again, there it is.